Hello, thank you for joining us today as we discuss why ear lens. My name is Drew Dundas. And I'm Susie Levy. I'm the Senior Director of Professional Education and Clinical Research here at EarLens. And I'm the Chief Technology Officer. As far as disclosures, both of us are employees of EarLens Corporation. So I'd like to start out by having you ask yourself, how many of your patients are truly delighted with their hearing? When we really think hard about this question, you know, we've really been hearing the same feedback from our patients for decades. Things don't sound natural. It just doesn't sound clear. It's not really meeting my expectations. I don't like the way my voice sounds. I can't hear in restaurants or I really end up taking them off. And of course, the one that we all roll our eyes about, music just sounds terrible. And am I ever gonna be able to play my instrument again? The fact of the matter is that patients are still seeking better options in 2021, the same as they were in 2011 and in 2001. And in fact, while we have seen improvements in people's attitudes towards hearing aids, the market penetration overall is still very disappointing. And we commonly hear from people who don't adopt that people have told them that hearing aids don't really work for them. When we ask the people who are first time uh, users or test drivers of technology who don't convert to purchasing a device, a majority of them report that the poor sound quality experience that they have is one of the primary reasons why they didn't decide to adopt that technology. And amazingly, even of the people who do adopt the technology, when we ask them, what would you like to improve with your next upgrade of technology? The number one thing that they're looking for is an improvement in the overall sound quality of that listening experience. So why ear lens? Well, we truly believe that we can transform the lives of hearing impaired listeners through better hearing. But where should we start in that quest to start to improve their hearing? When we think about the fundamental purpose of a hearing aid, it really is to improve the ability to hear speech over the broadest possible range of frequencies. And we think of that range of frequencies as the audible bandwidth that is achieved for that listener. But Drew, every manufacturer sort of claims broad bandwidth these days. So aren't we already achieving that? Well, I think that's an excellent question. And we kind of need to look at things from the perspective of the clinician and the real ear verification screen to understand this. Consider this screen shot taken from an audio scan VeriFit for a mild sloping to moderate hearing loss fit with a premium air conduction device. What really what we're looking at here is the sound pressure level that's achieved in the ear canal in response to that input. And uh, we look at that as a function of frequency across the graph. Normal hearing thresholds are represented by the dotted line at the bottom and the individual's hearing thresholds by the blue X's and line curving up and towards the right. Average level speech through the hearing aid as recorded at the individual's eardrum is represented by the green shaded region with the center line being the average level, the upper limit being the peaks and the lower limit being the valleys of that speech signal. Really at its simplest uh, interpretation, the areas that fall above the thresholds of hearing in the blue shaded region are sounds that the individual can hear, whereas the area below that line are the ones that they cannot. So one other thing that's very important for us to consider in here is what is the maximum possible output that's achievable with the hearing aid in response to a very loud input, and this is represented by the yellow dots and connected line that crosses the thresholds of hearing by about 5,000 or 6,000 hertz. Now, when really when we start to look at this, we immediately recognize that for speech level inputs, individual, this individual with a mild sloping to moderate loss really is only able to hear sounds out through about 4,000 hertz in that speech level input. So really we end up with a functional bandwidth for this mild sloping to moderate loss of less than 250 up to about 3,500 Hertz. That's not truly a very broad bandwidth. And we have to consider the fact that this is an open fit. So we have to ask ourselves, what's actually being produced by the hearing aid in the individual's ear versus what is coming in through the direct path past the hearing aid and into, uh, into the eardrum? Well, when we actually measure that by taking that same fitting and uh, closing off the ear and measuring only what comes from the contribution of the hearing aid, we see that there's actually not a whole lot happening in the lower frequencies. So it's a little disappointing to think about this bandwidth that we think that we're achieving for an individual 
as compared to what's actually being contributed by the hearing aid. So what is this individual actually getting from their hearing aid in terms of the frequency range of audible amplification? It's substantially lower. So this took me a little while to understand. Because although the device may be capable of processing sound up through 10 kilohertz or so, if the sound that it's producing is not above the person's threshold, it doesn't really have any effect on their hearing, right? That's absolutely right. And that's a really important take home for us when we think about this, because there's a world of difference between audible amplified bandwidth and processed bandwidth. It's absolutely true that these devices are capable of providing output through 10 kilohertz. But the question we have to ask ourselves and verify in the process is whether or not that output is audible to the listener. If it's not audible to the listener, how can they possibly benefit from it? So what do we have to do when we're fitting acoustic hearing aids within these constraints? Well, we have to provide extra loudness for the mid range of speech through that 800 to 4,000 Hertz region to achieve a normalization of overall loudness for the listener, similar to the peak that we see with the NAL NL2 prescription approach. And we have to listen through the vent to get the lows. And as a result, we end up losing the benefits of the signal processing, which is really the thing that differentiates between entry level mid range and premium hearing instruments. And frankly, because of the fact that the ma a maximum output of the device rolls off below threshold by about five to six kilohertz, we really have to give up on hearing the high frequencies altogether. There's simply no way to provide audibility for those sounds for this individual with only a moderate high frequency loss. So for those of you who are familiar with ear lens, you've probably seen these plots where we look at functional bandwidth of normal hearing versus with a conventional acoustic hearing aid. And you may have said, where does that come from? I know that hearing aids can produce 10 kilohertz bandwidth. Well, they do, but we're talking about audible processed bandwidth. What's actually benefiting that user by providing the signal processing and increase in audibility. Yeah, so people may say, yeah, but Drew, it's okay that we give up on the highs because when I try to push it there, it, I just get feedback and it sounds tinny and people don't like it, so I turn it down anyway. And if they have kind of not that much hearing loss in the lows, it's okay that it comes through the direct path. So the fact that hearing aids are optimized to work around the mid-range is okay and that we're giving up the others because aren't those, that mid-range, the most important frequencies for speech understanding. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, I think that a lot of people who have looked at the idea of the speech intelligibility index and the importance of those frequencies would say that, yeah, this is a, is a good justification, but it's also somewhat of an overreach, frankly. And that's because of the fact that the mid frequencies being most important doesn't mean that the rest are not important. And in fact, the research is very, very clear that hearing impaired listeners can benefit from an extended bandwidth of audibility relative to a narrower bandwidth of audibility. It's also very clear that having redundancy in the speech information that's present improves speech understanding, both in quiet and in background noise, and that it makes understanding that speech easier in terms of listening effort. And lastly, in terms of addressing that overall listening experience question, the broader bandwidth of audibility also allows for us to provide less mid frequency gain while still achieving that perception of getting help, getting benefit and having normal overall loudness perception. And when we do that and provide that broad bandwidth, both into the highs and the lows, we can achieve that without that complaint of tinniness. So, how is it possible then? What's so different about ear lens that allows us to provide that 10 kilohertz audible bandwidth? Well, if we think about conventional hearing aids, they all really work the same way uh, in terms of signal processing and functionality. A incoming sound is converted to an electrical signal, digitized, processed, and emitted as an amplified sound into the air that's inside the ear canal. And this vibrates the eardrum, stimulating the middle ear and the cochlea. And of course, the cochlea then converts that sound into nerve impulses where we perceive it as sound in our ear. Ear lens works very much the same way on the front end, but on the output side, things are very different. And this has some key advantages and benefits for us. Rather than emitting an amplified acoustic sound into the ear, ear lens encodes that audio signal in an ultra low power radio signal. That radio signal is transmitted from the ear tip into the ear canal to a custom built lens, which is placed on the eardrum of the individual by the ENT physician. This lens then directly vibrates the eardrum, 
allowing us to overcome the challenges of energy transfer into the ear and provide both low frequency and high frequency inputs without having to worry about having to block up the ear and without the challenges of acoustic feedback. Now, if we're not producing sound in the ear, how do we actually know that we're getting what we think we need in the ear? Well, that's an important part of the overall ear lens system. The real ear output levels are established via calibration, very similar to the way that we determine what the stimulation level should be for a cochlear implant. This allows us to capture not only the effective sound pressure level at the eardrum, but also the unique middle ear transfer function of the listener. And this allows us to provide a highly customized, highly accurate uh, listening experience for the individual. And because we're not producing sound in the ear, the output is not impacted by the individual's ear canal size or by changes to the venting. So we can get those lows, we can get those highs, even with a broadly vented canal. The result of all of this is that the fitting screen that you see and the curves that are on that screen are not estimates of what's happening for that individual. They are the real ear output levels that are achieved in response to soft, average, and loud speech in real time. So the beauty of this is that everyone who falls into this broad fitting range between mild and severe loss should enjoy a greater bandwidth of audibility for speech as well as superior sound quality with ear lens. So let me get this straight, go back one. So everyone who fits in that fitting range can get output, audible output from 125 to 10K for speech sounds with a widely vented fit. That's absolutely right. It's not the way most fitting ranges work. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And we've been very diligent in making sure that that fitting range is appropriate for being able to provide those individuals with audibility for even soft level speech, as long as their audiometric thresholds fit within that fitting range. And the difference that we see is clear when you compare a conventional device in the yellow to the ear lens aided thresholds in the blue, you can see what a dramatic difference this can make for an individual with mild to moderately severe loss. So that broad bandwidth of audibility from 100 hertz all the way up to 10 kilohertz is a dramatic difference for these listeners, providing them with two and a half times the audible bandwidth of a conventional vented fitting. And this really achieves a superior listening experience. So that magic is not in terms of anything more than that ability to be able to directly activate that system via the lens. That inductive direct drive technology overcomes those limitations of acoustic technology, eliminating the high frequency audibility limitations that are inherent to air conduction devices due to receiver technology and feedback. And secondly, providing a low frequency audio experience that allows people to capitalize on the benefits of advanced signal processing, like noise reduction and directionality, even while their ear is widely vented and providing them with a great listening experience in that vented condition when they're streaming audio. This combination achieves a very natural timbre, rich, full sound quality with very comfortable overall sound level and a bandwidth of audibility from below 100 hertz all the way up to 10,000 hertz, even for up to severe levels of hearing loss. Now, I, I mean, I'd love it though, if you could back up all these things that I claim with some clinical evidence. I know, it almost sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? So let's take a look at the clinical evidence. Now, I've been at this company for 11 years now, and over the course of that time, I've gotten to see a ton of evidence come out on the benefits of this technology. A lot of it is in peer-reviewed publications. And what um, we've been able to demonstrate is that this extended audible bandwidth has a significant positive impact on sound quality, subjective preference, and speech understanding and noise. And what's really cool is there's these two recent publications that came out of um, a study at the National Center for Audiology at University of Western Ontario, which specifically investigated the audibility of speech from 125 to 10 thousand hertz and speech understanding improvements for consonants plurals and also for complex speech in speech tasks and really pointed to this synergistic effect of providing both low and extended high frequency energy <clears throat> so i want to look at some of the evidence we're going to look at a peak of the evidence here starting with broad audible bandwidth so from this um, study done in canada 
they looked at, um, they recruited participants who are in the fitting range, they calibrated them as Drew was describing, and then they fit them to prescription. Um, as you can see below here, the prescription is the dotted line, and they had two programs that they were comparing, the full prescription out with audibility that extends through 10 kilohertz, and then a limited bandwidth condition, which was reflective of sort of the average um, maximum expected audibility you get from conventional devices. And what they did post calibration is they actually used the fitting screen to turn the audibility of the output down below threshold at 5K to achieve um, those two different conditions. And they confirmed their findings with aided threshold measurements, showing that you know they're starting out on average unaided with this mild sloping to moderately severe hearing loss. And then with the full bandwidth of amplification, you're raising all those thresholds up, extending out through 10K, confirming um, audibility of speech through 10 kilohertz. And then in limited bandwidth condition, you can see that those thresholds are reflected as well. So that's cool because it really does confirm that what you see on the fitting screen is what's being achieved in the listener's ear, right? Yeah, it's awesome. The verification stuff is built into the fitting process. So it's pretty easy to know and realize that you're fitting to targets in this case. So now let's look at that broad audible bandwidth and its impact on sound quality and subjective preference. So we're always interested to see if people are liking the sound that they're getting through their ear lens systems. And so over the course of all these studies, we're always um, asking about subjective preference and we always see a consistent trend that people prefer it. Um, here's an example of a study where we recruited participants who wore acoustic devices. We administered some questionnaires that had that asked about aspects related to preference of different sound quality aspects, like music, satisfaction, clarity, speech clarity, children's voices. And then we fit them with ear lens systems, allowed them to acclimatize, administered the questionnaires. Then we actually made them revert back to their acoustic devices and administered it again. This was to try to avoid the halo effect because people, you know, it's difficult to blind them to the system because it's, you know, high technology and they know they're wearing a lens and whatnot. But what was cool is that there's a significant preference across all these measures for um, the ear lens system, which persisted even after they reverted back to their prior devices. That is striking, really underlining the, the value of the overall quality of that listening experience to that patient's experience. Right. And we always get anecdotal reports that people really like the, the sound quality, um, such as this from Sheldon. Very cute. <laughs> but why are people saying that they really like this extended bandwidth of the airline system when if you try to push audibility for an acoustic product, people go, ah, that sounds tinny. So why are, why are we showing this consistent preference? It can be confusing to some people. But we know why now after lots of investigation. If you look at this chart from Warren Tan, what it shows is ratings of naturalness of different band limited stimuli of speech and music. So if you look at the very frontmost box there, that reflects a bandwidth from 313 to 3500 hertz. And people would rate the naturalness of a sound with that um, band limitation as being pretty low. If you keep the lower cutoff frequency at 313 and extend only into the high frequencies, like what would happen if you tried to push audibility in a vented RIC, right? You may achieve more audibility, but the naturalness will not improve. It may change, but it will not improve. So that's interesting. It kind of aligns with that idea that people don't necessarily like just getting the high frequencies. That's right. And if you keep that upper cutoff frequency at 3500 hertz and you give only more low frequencies, the naturalness also doesn't improve. They may notice a change. It's actually when you increase in both directions and extend actually into the very low frequencies that finally those high frequencies are perceived as being even more natural. So what it's pointing to is that you need a very broad bandwidth, including a foundational support in those low frequencies, very low frequencies, in order to accept and appreciate the crispness of all those high frequencies. Hmm. So that's how we can give people about, oh, I don't know, 60 dB of gain at 10K, and they say, oh, that sounds good, instead of take this off of me. That is amazing. <laughs> And here is a nice sound sample just showing you how important those low frequencies are in terms of general appreciation of sound quality.
look at some other parts of clinical evidence, the cool part, parts of speech and speech in complex environments. So if you think about what you would expect if you're giving more audibility above five kilohertz, what parts of speech would you expect to be affected? Well, S's and plurals and consonants that have energy in those higher frequencies, if you think of the speech banana. So in this Canada study, they looked at the difference between the full bandwidth of audibility and narrow bandwidth for word final plural detection, and they showed significant increase in performance. And also, they did a battery of consonant recognition and noise, and they showed a significant improvement in the full bandwidth condition. Why does that improvement look a little smaller? Well, because where the really significant improvements were, were in those consonants with high frequency information. There were more correct identifications and fewer confusions of S and F, T and K, V and Z, exactly like you would predict from speech banana. And that's pretty cool to be able to show that big a difference without having to distort the signal by introducing something like frequency lowering, right? Yeah, and some of these tests were um, developed in order to show the effectiveness of things like frequency lowering. But what we did in this case, or what this data shows, is that at super threshold conversational levels, people are indeed able to not only detect, but recognize speech sounds in these high frequencies, meaning they are getting audible speech information that is useful to them for performing better on speech tasks. And how does that help you, Drew? I like this example here. It's the joke you always make. Well, I mean, it's only a joke because we hear it so many times that patients struggle to understand what is being said, not that someone's talking. Did he say that it's 63 and sunny or that guy's 53 and funny? It's a critical difference that hinges upon hearing those consonants accurately. That's right. All right. So let's get into speech in complex environments. So a while back, we did a study um, simulated over headphones where we were trying to see if people could use information above four kilohertz in order to perform better on a complex speech and speech task. So we had early indications that people were gonna be able to use this in those most challenging of environments, which is speech and complex speech. So in the full year paper, which looked at the speech outcomes in the Canadian study, they replicated the same setup, but they did it on Ireland's wearers in the sound field, and they had those two conditions, the limited bandwidth and the full bandwidth condition. They did it not only in this sort of um, separated case, but they did it also in a couple other spatial configurations. And the effect size in the same in this asymmetric case was the same as we had measured in the simulation. That was really exciting to show that um, people were able to use this information, actual Ireland's users, to perform better on this complex speech task from having audibility above five kilohertz which is, you know, the frequencies that people tend to think, well, it's okay if people don't get that. It can actually help you in the most challenging of environments. So now the question I've been getting for the past 11 years is, okay, that's nice. How does it compare to acoustic technology? I, I want to be able to talk to my patients about if they can perform better on these tasks compared to conventional devices. So we did a study in our own lab presented at AAA this year where we um, recruited a bunch of participants who are in the fitting range and we fit them with premium RICs and we actually verified the fittings and fit them to target. Now it's important to note that even when these devices are fit to target, you're still seeing this same theme where the maximum average audibility that you can expect from a conventional acoustic device caps out at around five kilohertz. It's almost hidden in plain sight, isn't it? That's right. And we confirmed this again with aided sound field thresholds. And when participants were fit with the Irland system, again, you see that broadband audibility extending out through 10 kilohertz. Now, what we did is we found the level at which participants could get around 50% correct in this performance. And then we fixed the signal to noise ratio in this case, because we wanted to see if you're performing a kind of a 50% level in a restaurant, and then you switch to a different device, how much better would you perform in that restaurant? So when we measured that average sentence recognition with the premium RICs fit to target, participants scored about 55.7% correct. Those same participants fit with the airline system performed at 72.2% correct. Now all the features are on, these are premium products, fit to validated targets. This difference here is audibility. There is no feature that any hearing aid can apply to a signal that could give you this significant impact. This is purely the benefit of being able to hear more in these complicated environments. And it's in the frequency region that most people just get, you know, think we can give up on. It's amazing to think that people could go from effectively chance performance to getting three quarters of everything and really being back in the game in that same challenging environment where they felt like they were failing. That's, that's right. 
So why is this happening? Why is hearing speech and noise so tricky? And why is Ireland having showing such a big impact in that sort of holy grail of situations where people complain the most, right? I struggle to hear in restaurants. I still I can't tell the difference if they're you know, on or off. I take them off. Why is hearing speech and noise so tricky? Drew, you talked about it a little earlier. But it's such a complicated acoustic environment that there's a visual analog. When you're trying to understand speech and noise, it's like trying to find Waldo. When you're trying to find Waldo or listen to speech and noise and you're in this environment, there's lots of people talking, there's reverberation, there's other noises, there's dishes clinking, there's people at different locations around the room. There's so much information that what your brain is doing is feature, trying to feature see. Even mild hearing loss also has another detrimental effect, which is that it degrades temporal resolution, leading to a blurred sensation where people feel like things aren't clear, they're not crisp, it's really difficult to make things out, and it can just be nearly impossible to perform in these situations. Hearing aids work by trying to restore some of those um, features back to the person with hearing impairment. And they work to some degree, but you know, there's still like often reported a lack of clarity in Christmas and I just can't quite make it out. People end up trying to guess, you know, they take their best guess of how they can perform. The way Earlands is helping is by restoring more of those features back to the person with hearing impairment and what allowing their own brain to be able to take advantage of that and kind of solve this complicated riddle. And that's what we're seeing in that data there. It's amazing. So We've accumulated a nice amount of evidence over the years showing um, not only is it real is having this extended audible bandwidth really important for sound quality, but people like it. And also it leads to these great objective benefits in terms of speech understanding and quiet and noise. So you could say that the answer to why ear lens is to go beyond conventional devices and truly delight patients with a hearing experience that they consider to be transformational. That's right. Thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions, we're here to answer. And please visit our site at www.earlens.com. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Susie.
everyone, and thank you to Dr. Ramos for allowing us to speak about ear lens today. The goal of this talk is to review candidacy guidelines for the ear lens technology so that you can offer the benefits of an increased bandwidth of sound to your patients. I am Michelle and Sarah, and I am an otologist, and I have been working with ear lens and fitting ear lens for over five years. In the second half of our presentation, I will be handing it over to Dr. Eskridge, who is the manager of audiologist, audiology support services at EarLens, and she is an essential partner with me in helping us provide an optimal and successful EarLens experience to our patients. Here are our disclosures. So I will first be reviewing the audiometric and anatomical factors uh, for consideration in the ear lens process. And then I will also be reviewing the clinical flow between the ENT physician and the audiologist. That is really important. Finally, Dr. Mitchell reviews some case studies to highlight the value of the ear lens compared to acoustic hearing aid devices. So first, when a patient comes in, they will meet with the audiologist and undergo a hearing test. And they must fit within our hearing range, which is from a mild to a severe sensor neural hearing loss. And they must have no more than two octave frequencies that fall out of range. We also recommend a word recognition score greater than 50% and a type A tympanogram there should be no significant conductive hearing loss. And we hope that there be a less than 10 dB air bone gap present. Also, there shouldn't be any significant fluctuating hearing loss or rapidly progressive hearing loss that's um, changing on a day-to-day -day basis, such as in active Meniere's disease. Next, the patient will see the physician and undergo evaluation to check the anatomy. The ear should have a healthy TM and ear canal, and the physician should be able to visualize all of the eardrum so that it can be properly cleaned and evaluated for lens placement and impressions. There are some absolute contraindications, including T uh, eardrum perforation, a deep pars flaccid retraction pocket that might collect debris and cause a cholesteatoma, a very atelectatic eardrum or significant retraction would also be a contraindication, and someone who has chronic otitis externa issues, dermatitis, or a chronically moist ear would also not be a candidate. There are some relative contraindications, and these include a monomeric or dimeric membrane. We leave this up to the discretion of the physician. The monomer or dimeric membrane, if present, should be small and should not have a, um, should not appear too thin uh, because of the concern for possible perforation with the impression process. However, I have done a few small monomeric and dimeric membranes without any issue. Another relative contraindication is restriction of the canal anatomy from either exostoses or bony osteomas, as you see in these two pictures. However, a small osteoma or sh very shallow exostoses would not be a contraindication if you think there is plenty of room to place the lens. So for example, in this patient with a small osteoma, there is room to still place the lens over the eardrum and work around that osteoma. And this patient does indeed wear a ear lens today. Other considerations to think about. You may wanna ask your patient if there are any significant skin allergies or history of eczema or psoriasis, as this might create problems when the lens is in place if they have any dermatitis issues. You will also want to avoid patients who have had significant radiation therapy to the head, such as nasopharynx uh, radiation for carcinoma or any prior adenoid radiation in the past. 
keep in mind that the lens must be taken out for MRIs and also should not be worn while scuba diving. Swimmers can wear the ear lens and we do recommend an, a swim plug if they are a very frequent swimmer or if they're planning to swim in lake or ocean waters. And finally, as you're examining the patient, it is important to make sure that they are tolerant of uh, deep cleaning and touching within the canal, bony canal area. Because so let's review the clinical flow for ear lens. As I mentioned, there's an important partnership between both the audiologist and the doctor in helping the patient achieve success with the ear lens. So first, as I mentioned in the consultation, you would have the audiologist meet with the patient and do the hearing test. At this time, they would also do a sound comparator, which demonstrates the, what the increased bandwidth of the ear lens can provide to them. And we also recommend that they review the patient's hearing goals and to list three of the important listening situations that they would like to improve. Once they see the doctor, again, we will be evaluating the ear canal for any issues that may prevent placement of the lens or uh, cause difficulty with the impression process. I also review their expectations and go over um, any of their questions. At this point, if they are wanting to proceed with the ear lens, the impressions can be done the same day. However, it does take approximately a half an hour to perform to perform bilateral impressions, and sometimes this may need to be done at a separate visit. So if they do have a separate, separate visit, this would just be with the physician alone for the impressions. And the impressions are the foundation from which the custom-made ear lens and the ear tip are made for the ear lens system. This is then manufactured by the EarLens Corporation and usually it is sent back to the clinic um, with the complete kit in about two weeks. At that time, a placement appointment will be scheduled. First, they will see the physician who will clean the ear canal and the eardrum and then place the lens on the ear. This is actually quite a quick process um, contrary to the impression process and usually is uh, done within about 15 minutes. They will then spend the bulk of their time with the audiologist who will adjust the settings and calibrate them and perform any uh, programming uh, changes and just give them general instructions for use. Now here is the placement. Um, on the left, you can see a right ear with a right lens in position. And on the right side is a left ear with the left lens in position. Now remember that even though the lens seems to be covering quite a bit of the eardrum, it is really only the three millimeter umbo platform sitting on the umbo itself that is in contact with the eardrum. The rest of the lens that you see there is suspended about a millimeter above the surface of the eardrum and not in direct contact. But in both the bottom pictures, you can see the nice fit of the perimeter platform. And at the placement uh, visit, I also discuss uh, the oil regimen of the patient. They will use an oil spray two to three times weekly and this is important in keeping the lens seated properly on the eardrum and also in keeping the wax uh, to a minimum and the ear canal moisturized. I also will review some expectations for a mild sense of autophony that can be experienced, which usually the brain adapts to within a few weeks and also the small chance of having a sense of damping or muffled hearing when the processor is not being worn. And this would occur mainly at night and is usually minimal on the order of, you know, about two decibels. So many patients will not notice this. 
After the placement, they then enter the fitting optimization period, which is 60 days. During this time, the audiologist will typically check on them at two weeks and review how they are doing and make any programming changes if necessary. At one month, the doctor will then see the patient and check on the position of the lens and confirm the fit and also review their oil regimen and see if it is adequate, whether they need to increase oil or even decrease the oil at that time. Then the patient will proceed to the audiologist well, where they will again check on the fitting and calibration, uh, review hearing goals, and even do some measurements of word recognition scores in noise if needed. And then finally, during this fitting optimization period, the patient has access to a concierge service that will do some minor troubleshooting and answer basic questions and also help communicate with the home clinic. The concierge service is also available throughout the service plan and will check in on the patient quarterly. During the service plan, which is three years, the doctor will see the patient anywhere between quarterly to maybe every four to six months for ear cleaning and to check on the lens. And the audiologist will again see the patient typically at the same time uh, during the same visit to uh, check calibration and make sure they are functioning up to uh, optimal settings. Now we'll move on to some case studies that you can uh, compare to some of your patients. Well, thank you, Dr. and Sarah. Um, I'll go into talking about patients that you may see in your clinic. And as you see them, I want you to think about if ear lens may be appropriate for them. So let's talk about our patient that we saw in our clinic here in Menlo Park, patient FY. He was an acoustic hearing aid user, and he noticed that with his acoustic devices, he could hear sounds louder, but he had quite a number of complaints with his acoustic devices. One being that he got periodic feedback or whistling, and that speech understanding was still difficult despite his use of his acoustic devices. Music sounded unnatural, and all sounds had a generally tinny sound quality. Now, let's talk about why his acoustic hearing aids may have been so disappointing. We can see here uh, on his audiogram that he has a steeply sloping hearing loss, and those can be pretty tricky hearing losses to fit because we need to balance the provision of giving high frequency gain with the desire for an open and comfortable fit for the patient. Now we can fit him with occluded domes and he was fit with occluded domes, but um, the patient rejected them because of occlusion. And occluded domes of course have the potential to stop the feedback and improve sound quality, but the patient didn't like the feel of them. Um, so decided to re revert back to the open fit. So as a refresher, let's talk about why feedback occurs. Now feedback is pretty common with acoustic hearing devices because in acoustic devices, a sound wave in the environment is picked up by the microphones and it, that sound wave is amplified and sent down the ear canal. But if we have an open fitting, some of that acoustic energy that's in the ear canal can escape out of the ear canal and those sound waves can be picked up again by the microphones after they've been amplified and start this vicious feedback cycle. In fact, 70% of acoustic hearing aid users wanted reduced feedback in their next hearing aid purchase according to market track data. Now with ear lens, because we use the direct drive mechanism, we don't place a sound wave in the ear canal. And so we don't have acoustic feedback that occurs with our devices. And our patients and the loved ones of our patients using ear lens really appreciate that they don't have this whistling or squealing sound. 
Now, here we can see patient FY's results with the ear lens devices. His aided thresholds with ear lens are here on the right. And as you can see, he's getting significant benefit in those high frequencies. But he's also reporting no feedback any longer, improved sound quality overall, things don't sound as tinny. He's getting adequate gain for speech, so speech understanding is easier for him. And he has that comfortable open fit still. So he's a very satisfied patient. All right, our next patient is DC. So as you can see here on his audiogram, he has a mild to moderate hearing loss. He also has some noise exposure history through his vocation, um, but had not been wearing hearing protection. Understanding conversation had started to become difficult for him and he had noticed that he was asking for repeti repetition quite a bit. So that was becoming a little bit embarrassing for him. Now he was not an acoustic hearing device user, but knew that he needed some help with his hearing. So he seeked out ear lens. Now let's talk about why we should treat mild hearing losses. Well, we know from research that untreated hearing loss can put patients at risk for dementia in later life. Even mild hearing loss patients have twice the risk of dementia if they have untreated hearing loss than patients with normal hearing. But it's encouraging to know that clinical intervention with well-fit amplification may promote the reversal of brain changes in the auditory cortex um, that make those centers not as useful for auditory information and can provide cognitive benefit in people with mild to moderate hearing loss. So here at our clinic, we make it a point to educate our patients with mild to moderate hearing loss about the risks for dementia. And we encourage them to get fitted with amplification devices. And we did that in the case with DC. So as you can see, he's getting benefit in those high frequencies, especially where he has a majority of his hearing loss. And his reports are that he's having marked improvement in speech understanding. And he's not having to ask people to repeat themselves as much as he was. And he wears his ear lens devices consistently. They're not just sitting in a drawer. Many patients that have mild to moderate hearing loss and use acoustic devices uh, may find themselves not wearing the acoustic devices as frequently as they should because of poor sound quality. But because we have this broadband spectrum amplification with ear lens, patients report a much improved sound quality over conventional devices and are more prone to actually using their devices more frequently. And our last patient is patient GG. He's an accomplished classical music composer and has composed several opera, chamber, choral, and orchestral pieces. He's been an acoustic hearing aid user for quite some time and actually had tried multiple brands of, of acoustic devices. Now, despite multiple brands and multiple programming adjustments, music just still didn't sound quite right to him. And he was looking for improved sound quality and better enjoyment of music. So let's talk about music sound quality and broadband with amplification. Now we know that listeners require the pedal stool of the low frequencies in order to appreciate and accept the crispness of the highs. And that comes from research done by Brian Moore and colleagues. You may wonder if patients can actually tolerate those high frequencies uh, that ear lens provides. And we actually see that they do. This graph here shows that research subjects who were listening to speech and music sounds um, with the bandwidth of a conventional hearing device rated the perceived naturalness of the signals as being pretty low. But when the listeners had the bandwidth 
of ear lens, they actually rated the naturalness of sounds as much higher. And we see that with our patients every day. Now we use CAM2 as our fitting formula with our devices and it's a broad bandwidth algorithm. And so we have a very balanced sound from the very low frequencies that, provide, that we provide down to 125 Hertz, all the way up to those high frequencies we provide at 10,000 Hertz. And this results in a very balanced and natural loudness for our patients and optimal sound quality. Now, patient GG's results with ear lens are here on the right. And as you can see, he's getting benefit across the entire frequency spectrum. And he's reporting noticeable improvements for speech understanding and music sound quality. He rated ear lens as being tops for music after trying numerous acoustic devices. And we see him primarily for routine appointments only, which is pretty remarkable if we think about how often he had to return for fitting adjustments and reprogramming or little tweaks with his acoustic devices so that music would sound better. We really don't have to see him for many tweaks because using that CAM2 fitting formula and having our broadband amplification leads him to better sound quality without the need to, to tweak as frequently. So in summary, ideal ear lens candidates are those patients that have hearing loss and word recognition scores that fall within the guidance range that Dr. and Sarah showed us earlier. They have sensory neural hearing loss, an intact and normal tympanic membrane, and open ear canal anatomy. They have hearing goals that can be addressed with the ear lens solution, including patients who want virtually no feedback with an open fit, improve speech understanding in quiet situations and noisy situations, and improve speech and music sound quality. And your ideal ear lens candidates are motivated to try something new in order to gain better hearing. Your less than, ide your less than ideal ear lens candidates would be cochlear implant candidates that are looking for a non-surgical last ditch effort before undergoing surgery. Those would be patients that have hearing loss that falls outside of the guidance range with word recognition scores that fall below 50%. Also patients that have conductive hearing losses, surgical ears and or restrictive and narrow ear canal anatomies would not be ideal candidates for ear lens. Patients that cannot tolerate ear cleaning would not be appropriate either. And if patients have hearing goals that cannot be addressed with ear lens, such as wanting an invisible hearing solution or wanting Bluetooth connectivity to Android devices, those patients also would not be ideal ear lens candidates. So the next time you're in your clinics and you hear patients with reports similar to these, you know, I still don't do well hearing in restaurants or gosh, I wish my hearing aid sounded less tinny, or I really miss how music used to sound, or I'm still struggling when there's background noise. We want you to think of ear lens. Well, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>